Come on, would you just say those words right now? Say them out loud in your house. I'm going to see a victory. You, if you're sitting there with your family, go ahead, look at your spouse and say, we're going to see a victory. Come on, I want to believe right now. I, I, I feel in my heart that even what we're going to go through in the Word, you really are going to see a victory. A victory in your thought life, a victory in your home life, a victory in your marriage. And today, as Chris has led us in that song, I want us to declare that today. So Father, I pray that over every household, I pray that over every heart, and especially today, I'm praying it over every mind that there is going to be a victory today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, say amen out loud and then join with us to say those words one more time. I'm going to see a victory. This is going to be a special day. I want you to follow with me as we get a chance just to go through the word today. I want to believe for God to do something really special because I want to give you really a pathway to that victory that we just sang about today. I was reading this amazing article that literally stunned me that it's called The Woman Who Gets Lost Every Day. The Woman Who Gets Lost Every Day. In fact, there is a condition that I was reading about that I didn't even know existed. Listen to this. It's called DTD. It's called Developmental Topographical Disorientation. That literally, it's the loss of an internal compass. It's being directionally challenged. I thought that just comes with men while they're driving, but literally, it is an actual condition that you are constantly at a loss for where you are that literally affects so many people. In fact, it says, she says, I can't even form a mental map even when I leave my house. She was talking about with her and many, many others that she says I, was, I would go out at a friend's house, walk the dog a few blocks away from my house, and she said, and all of a sudden, I started, I started to realize this fear started to pulsate through me that I'm just a few blocks away, but I have no idea where I'm at. No internal compass, no mental map was made. She said, all of a sudden, anxiety, sweat profusely began to come because of this DTD, this, this disorder that literally will not tell you where you are. She said, everything looked familiar. In fact, her words was, I thought I'd been dropped into the middle of a foreign land. In fact, this is what it said. It said, people who have this condition basically get lost every day in the most familiar surroundings. <laughs> listen, listen to that one more time. People who have DTD, this condition, get lost every day in the most familiar surroundings. This culture that we live in is sending us so many messages, so many things are coming our way every single day that I'm even listening today to Christians. I'm on the phone um, dialoguing with them um, through social media and, and, and literally face to face, I'm listening to Christians getting lost every day through the, their familiar surroundings. Literally, people are listening today that are lost while they're listening to sermons, like lost, don't even know, no mental compass, no compass to even guide them. They've lost that internal compass. It's a battle for the mind that's coming. The great writer, A.W. Tozer, listen to these words, said it like this, 10,000 thoughts a day pass through our minds and they try to predict what we will become. 10,000 thoughts every day are coming our way trying to predict what our future is going to be and who you're going to become. And today, I want to say, what, I want to say verbally what you just sang today. Today, we're going to see a victory. Today, we're going to see that there is help. Finally, I want you to know today, there is a way to fight these negative thoughts, those 10,000 thoughts that are trying to come and predict what you're going to become. Today, I believe there's a way that we're going to fight this. I knew yesterday, I have to tell you, I finally just blurted out loud yesterday as I was praying, praying for you, praying for this service, praying for those today that is going to get a new compass inside of them, a spiritual compass at the very end of this, because today many people are going to make a decision that's going to change their eternity by being born again. But I want you to listen for a moment. Yesterday, I said the words out loud. I said, God, I will say what you want me to. God, I will speak this. And I feel like today there is going to be a victory today. Paul said it like this in order to fight that spiritual DTD. This is what he says in Romans 12 too. Listen to these powerful words. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Here it is. How, Paul? 
by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. In fact, the, the NLT says it like this. This is powerful. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you, watch this, into a new person by changing the way you think. Not, being, not having 10,000 thoughts come in and predict, but the new person changing the way you think. Then, then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. See, those two phrases are antagonistic to each other. Those two phrases conformed and transformed. That's what Paul was trying to tell us. There is, a, there is an, a fight that's going on between conforming to the world and a transformed mind. In fact, let me just define them for you. To be conformed to this world is really the ideals, the opinions of the culture around you, that they're trying to dictate who you are, which become. That's the conforming to this world are the 10,000 thoughts are constantly coming your way. But Paul begins to, to, to juxtaposition, put right next to conformed and says, you don't have to be that way. Those 10,000 thoughts, those 10,000 messages that are coming your way don't have to determine who you are going to be. He says, because now as a new creature, as a new person in Christ, you can be transformed. What does that word mean? The word actually means to renovate, to, to, to a reformation of how you begin to think. See, what Paul was telling us is that we're told that the difference between being conformed and being transformed is when our mind is renewed. And this is the battle that every one of us face. Because if God can help me, if God can help you to have a transformed mind, this is, this is, this is so profound what Paul tells us. He says this, he says, because the goal of a transformed or renewed mind, you ready for this, is the learning of the will of God. That's what he says. That's what Romans 12, 2 says. Then you will learn to know God's will for you. This, this is what he was saying. If, if I cannot let you be conformed to those 10,000 thoughts that are constantly pummeling you every day, but have a renewed mind, he says the goal of this is then you're going to know what the will of God is. Pastor Tim, what, what is the will of God? I thought that's like who I'm going to marry and, and, and you know, what my job is supposed to be. What is my destiny? I think it's simpler than that. I really, let, let me just say what I think the will of God is. I think the will of God is what God wants me to do next. The will of God is God's next step for me. I, I want to know with a renewed mind, a transformed mind, God's next step. What God wants me to do today, what God wants me to do next. Instead of taking it a huge will of God um, definition, let's just break it down simply like that. Because unless you renew your mind and I renew my mind, we don't get the progress as a Christian, the next step or that DTD steps in that says, I'm lost in familiar surroundings. I could sit in those red chairs behind me and still not know what my next step is. This is where the renewal of mind comes in. Get this now. Changed lives are from renewed minds. Changed lives are from renewed minds. Can I... Can I ask you a question that has been haunting me? And it's this. How do we end up with messed up new creations in Christ? How do, how, how, how do we end up with people that have, um, been, that, that have been changed by Jesus, born again? How do we end up with messed up new creations in Christ? It's because of the renewal of the mind. I, I was reading the story of one of the most incredible thinkers um, and one of the greatest Christians in American history, Jonathan Edwards, the third president of Princeton University. In fact, not just Christians, across the board. They, many believe, historians believe, that Jonathan Edwards, who began the first great awakening in our country, was probably one of the greatest minds that ever lived. It, I, I was reading the story of his family, and it said that Jonathan Edwards had a daughter with a horrible temper, um, an anger problem, and as often as the case, the problem was never known outside. And in his biography, it just talks about how he was dealing with his daughter that would just go into fits of rage against her parents. And, and here you have the greatest, the greatest thinker, one of the greatest thinkers, but yet dealing with, with something that was happening in the house. And the story goes on to say that a young man fell in love with Jonathan Edwards' daughter. In fact, fell in love with her so much that he wanted to marry her and came to 
Jonathan Edwards to ask for her hand in marriage. Let me read to you the exchange. It says, um, I want to marry your daughter. And he said to the young man, you can't have her, was the abrupt answer. But I love her, the young man said. Um, you can't have her, Edwards persisted. But she loves me. He, and Edwards finally said, you can't have her. And finally, the young man just goes, why? And he said, but because she is not worthy of you. And, he's, and he goes, but isn't she a Christian? And then Edwards says this, yes, she is a Christian. Listen to these words. He's, and then Edwards, in, the, in, his, in his profundity, said these words. Sometimes the grace of God can live with some people with whom no one else can live with. Think of those words for a second. The grace of God can live with people who no one else can live with. Folks, li listen to me. That has to change. We've got to fix that. I, I don't want believers that have the grace of God in them, but nobody else can be with them. That only grace can be with them, but nobody else wants to hang out with them. This is where we have to begin to say we want our re minds renewed because when the mind is renewed, when we begin to realize change lives come from renewed minds. And this is what's so important for us. If I'm a new creation and have grace in me, then I know that God can begin to remove the DTD and all of a sudden I start to realize I don't just have grace, I have friendships, I have relationships. I'm beginning to move forward. Get, get this, listen to this. Don't believe everything you think. Let me say that again because these are the 10,000, these are the fights that go on that sometimes we get these thoughts, those 10,000 thoughts that Tozer talks about, and we start to believe every single one of them, which literally becomes the thing that's holding us towards victory. We're living in a society today that we're, as we're facing the pandemic and quarantine, and some, some, some states are at phase three, then have to drop down to phase one, and some phases over here, and then there's spikes here, and then, and then all these cases, and then we're dealing with civil unrest, and 10,000 thoughts come our way, and I have to tell you this, don't believe everything you think. We have got to make sure that they are God thoughts that are coming. See, it is in the mind that the new nature and the old nature are constantly at war. So how do we transform this mind? How do we, how do we leave conformed to transformed when we're dealing with that? Because that word, that word to renew, the renewal of your mind, actually means renovation, to renovate to reform, to, um, it's, it's, a build, it's a building word that some say. Um, people who have ever renovated property or renovated a house or a room or a basement, always remember this, the, the, the people who have done this realize renovation usually costs more than you expected and takes longer than you expected. And that's okay because the cost is worth it if we can move from conformed to transformed and really see God breaking ground for us today with the renewed mind. We're in a time in our country where we're consistently being challenged to think ungodly thoughts that, that are trying to keep us conformed, the 10,000 thoughts that are coming. And today, we are starting a renovation project. We are, we are challenging our church, you that are listening around the city, around the country, and around the world to start the renovation of the mind today. Our schools, our universities are trying to conform your children and our grandchildren by giving them ungodly thoughts, conforming, conforming thoughts. Remember what conforming is? To, to conform, to agree with the ideals of a culture, to begin to, to sign up for the things that of what others are saying are true as opposed to what God is saying a renewed mind is supposed to think. They're trying to begin to, um, uh, in, in, in culture, they're trying, they're trying to inoculate with thoughts that are, that are anti-God, that are anti-word, anti-truth. This verse from Colossians is hopeful for us as believers today, for you, for your children. Listen to what one paraphrase says of Colossians 3.10. For you have acquired a new creation life, which is continually being renewed into the likeness of the one who created you, giving you the full revelation of God. Now listen to this. In this new creation life, this is powerful. Your nationality makes no difference, nor your ethnicity, education, or economic status. They matter nothing, for it is Christ that means everything. As he lives in every one of us, 
is what the, the Apostle Paul tells us in that, in that passage. What he was saying was, as a new creation, we are going to have new thoughts. The renovation begins to start in the mind. How come? Because if we don't begin to fight the thoughts that are happening up here, this is the battle. It's, it, it's, the, it's the, life, the, the life and lifestyle that starts, to get, that starts to get affected by it. An old saying, an old, an old saying says it like this, sow a thought, reap an action. Sow an action and then you'll reap a habit. If you keep sowing a habit, you're going to reap a lifestyle. And if you sow a lifestyle, you'll eventually reap a destiny. I, I, will, I want to share and show you how we fight those thoughts. That finally there's a way to fight those 10,000 things trying to predict what you'll become, your children will become, your grandchildren will become. Those things that are trying to conform us instead of a renewed mind that's transforming us. This passage that I want to give you today, I want to, I want to, I want to be as simple as I can because this is the way I have really got my weapons to fight these thoughts to move from conforming to transforming, the renewing of my mind. This passage has literally been a life preserver for me. Let me read it to you. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. This is what the Apostle Paul says. He says, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, listen to this phrase, to the pulling down of strongholds. And then he says this, casting down imaginations. And here's what, this is going to be really important to remember. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. I want to repeat that again. He says, we're not only casting down imaginations and tearing down strongholds, but against every high thing that exalts itself, goes up higher against the knowledge of God, and we bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. The message, Eugene Peterson says it like this, we use our powerful God tools for smashing warped philosophies, tearing down barriers erected against the truth of God, fitting every loose thought and emotion and impulse into the structure of a life shaped by Christ. Listen to those words that the Apostle Paul tells us. He's telling us that pulling down strongholds and casting down imaginations describe the battle of the mind for the believer. Think of those two phrases. Pulling down strongholds, casting down imaginations. He says this is the fight of the renewed mind. This is the fight between conformed and transformed. This is the fight of, of not allowing 10,000 messages that come our way from, from politicians, from D.C., from a society, from a mob to begin to tell us this is the way you're supposed to think. Not, not as a believer. We go, there's a difference between being conformed and transformed, and I need the renewal of your mind. You know what a stronghold is? Let me explain this to you. Do you know what a stronghold is? It is a fortress. Keep, it keeps things in and keeps stuff out. Out. That's what it is. In fact, it keeps wrong thinking in. It's a wall that goes up. That's what the word stronghold actually means, fortress. Some versions of the Bible will say fortress. Um, to, to begin to realize, instead of stronghold, it's these walls that go up to keep thoughts in, keep things out, or we'll say it this way, keeps wrong thinking, wrong, wrong thoughts, the conforming thoughts in, and keeps truth God's truth, the knowledge of God outside of it. See, the message of our culture is trying to build those fortresses to, to, to keep out the truth of God, thoughts about God, thoughts about human sexuality, thoughts about marriage, thoughts about finances, thoughts even about the church, the existence of God that is constantly being pounded, 10,000 thoughts every single day. Society wants you to sort them out by your political affiliation. Are you a Democrat? Are you a Republican? Do you watch Fox News or CNN? Are you Biden or are you Trump? And they want you to decide what gets in the fortress based upon sometimes those, those, those affiliations. And can I, can I just let you know today this has nothing to do with us as a Christian. It has everything to do with we want the God thoughts in and we want the wrong thoughts out. That's what God is challenging us to do. See, we all face rogue thoughts today, thoughts that are not God thoughts. How do these thoughts begin to build walls to keep God's thoughts out? I want to ask you a question today. Listen to this question. How do thoughts become strongholds? Answer, 
when the thought, this is according to this passage, is raised higher than the knowledge of God. Let me say that again. How do those thoughts, those 10,000 thoughts, how do they slip in to become a stronghold, the fortress? How does the wall go up? When the wall goes up, it goes up, here it is, when the thought, one of those 10,000 things seep in, when the thought is raised higher, this is 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, higher than the knowledge of God. Remember the passage? He says, every high thing, he's talking about those thoughts, the 10,000 thoughts, every high thing that exalts itself, raises higher, goes higher than the knowledge of God. Do you understand what's happening? When one of those thoughts come in and start to build a wall and start to put the bricks to keep the good stuff out and the bad stuff in, what has just taken place is that that thought now begins to go higher than the knowledge of God, the word of God. See, strongholds are thoughts that go higher than God's word. Let me say that again. Strongholds, strongholds in thinking, imaginations are thoughts that go higher than God's truth, God's word. It goes higher than God's thoughts. See, we have to renew our minds, according to this passage, with the knowledge of God, who he is, his nature, his character, what he has done, what he has revealed himself to be in the word of God to fight these strongholds. Here's the question. Where do we get the knowledge of God? Here it is, from the word of God. Where do, where do we know more about God? From the word of God. That's his self-revelation. That's where God begins to say, here's who I am. Here's how, I've, here, here's how I act. We, we get the knowledge of God from the word of God, or, or just as simple as this. The word of God is the knowledge of God. That's where we learn it. Not, not just, not, not simply from books, but from the book, from the word of God. And that's why we have a responsibility to grow in the knowledge of God. Second Peter 3.18 tells us, listen to these powerful words, grow not only in the grace, but in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Peter ends up to him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Think of those words. Grow when the, when the grace that you received at salvation, he says you have a responsibility then to continue on. See, growing in the knowledge of God means I don't know enough about God. The, the moment I become a Christian, I don't know enough about him. Why? Because he says I have to grow in that. See, here's the catch. This is what I start to realize as a Christian. I've been, I've been born again for many, many decades, and this is what I've realized. As I get older, the battles get bigger, and therefore God has to become greater in my life. Let me say that again. As I get older, the battles are becoming bigger. But God must become greater to me than he's ever been before. Or those strongholds raise up. When those walls start to go up from our society, I got to make sure God is greater. When those things begin to come against me, those 10,000 thoughts, God has to be higher. See, knowing God then, the knowledge of God, knowing God becomes my weapon against those things. Here, here's how it works. Now I want to just get as practical as I can in the next few moments. Listen to this. I believe that, okay, let me, just, let me just say this again. The knowledge of God is in the word of God, and my knowledge of God must grow because my battles are getting greater. So that, we've, we've, we've established that. But here's what I want you to realize. There are two instruments involved in the renewal of the mind. It's the spirit of God and the word of God. In order to renew this mind, it's the Holy Spirit and the word of God that works together. Because the spirit of God uses the word of God to convict me. When a thought, when one of those 10,000 thoughts starts to contradict God's truth, the spirit of God begins to use the word of God. Pause for a second, because if I can challenge you to do anything, listen, Christians, whether you've been saved for one week, one minute, or you've been saved for 10 years, when we put the word of God inside of us, we're, we're every single day, it is our protection. It's the Spirit of God uses the Word of God to fight those, those thoughts that are trying to come in. Here's, here's how I, I've seen it work for me. Listen to this. When you take in the Word of God, you're reading a passage, and you're faced with an outside mindset that wants to come in to try to conform you, it's interesting because then the alarm goes off. Then, then the alarm, when, when you take the Word of God, 
And then all of a sudden, the Spirit of God begins to say, it's one of those 10,000 thoughts. It's trying to come in. It's trying to take over. It's trying to take over. All of a sudden, the alarm goes off because it's trying to conform me. It's trying to set. It's trying to get that thought higher than the knowledge of God. That's the contrast of 2 Corinthians chapter 10. These thoughts are raised up higher than the knowledge of God. It, when, we, when we become a Christian, we're going, God, this is the way to eternity. We must be born again, John 3, 3, John 3, 5. But all of a sudden, when sometimes we're faced with these, with these fortresses, and those fortresses, those strongholds, can be religious strongholds. We can go like, no, 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 I was told I have to be water baptized to become a Christian. I was told I have to be a good person in order to, for God to love me. I have to, I have, to um, have communion for all this to happen. And what happens is, the, the, the tradition, even religious thoughts, start to go up higher than the knowledge of God and what God says, even in the word of God. That's, that's when the Holy Spirit starts setting off the alarm going, this is, this is, as I heard one man say, this is kind of stinking thinking is what's happening here. This is not, this is not what God says. This is where something got a little bit higher. It, it goes like this. Let me say, let me say it like this. Um, it's, it becomes like the TSA checkpoint at the airport. When you're trying to get something through that's not supposed to go on the journey, whether the, the liquid is over 3.5 ounces or there is something metal that's not supposed to go on, there's some lithium battery that's not supposed to go underneath or whatever the alarm goes off for, what they're saying is that can't pass through, that can't go on your journey. It could be detrimental to the journey. Folks, that's exactly what the word of God does. The word of God says, wait, that thought is coming in. The alarm goes off and says, don't take that on your journey. There's a, there's, a, there's a lifestyle and a destiny that God has for you as a woman of God, as a child of God, as a single person, as a person in the work world, as whether you're working on, in finance or in law, whether you're in the tech department or in professional sports. He says, don't take that in. This is going to try to conform you. The alarm goes off because the spirit of God goes, don't take that on the journey. That could be detrimental. And we have to attack those thoughts that are trying to go higher than the knowledge of God. And then you realize this. Listen to me close. When you fill your mind with God's words, God's word, then you will have no more room for Satan's lies to erect a stronghold. Hallelujah. Let me say that again. When you fill your mind with God's words, not just books, not religious stuff, with God's words, then you'll have no more room for Satan's lies. The TSA checkpoint goes off, says, don't take that on the journey. Don't let that, don't, don't let that thought get up any higher. Folks, this is, this is victory for us today, like Chris sang for us. This is the victory when those negative thoughts want to begin to come in. But let, me, let me make it as simple as I can. It's, let me, let's, let's take a couple of those and show how the, how the conforming, how the strongholds try to go up and how we fight it with the word of God. And then we'll close. Listen. How, anger. Let me just deal with anger for a second because I experienced that. I don't have a car here in New York, but I happened to drive last week. And let me just tell you something. Anger and driving in New York City go together. Let me just tell you that. And I was dropping my family off at the airport. And as I was coming back, driving back, all of a sudden I felt this anger coming up because people didn't realize that the manufacturers put this stick on the side of a steering wheel that when you push it down, it lets the car behind you know where you're going to turn. And if you push it up, it lets you know they're turning left. And I don't think people understand that that stick on the side is not optional. And as you're driving and then people are just turning and everything else that I'm going, I'm going, could somebody use a blinker? Could somebody use a turn? And all of a sudden I'm watching this thought going, man, this, this will release it, Tim, release the anger of these blinker challenged people. Really? That's the stronghold going like this, this will make you feel better as you're driving, put one hand in the air and have a face. This, that that will make you feel better. That's the conforming thought. That's the 10,000 thoughts that are coming in. Anger, release it, show the rage, to, because they should know better. But all of a sudden, I realize as I'm sitting in that car by myself, or I thought by myself, but the problem is the Holy Spirit was in the car also. Didn't pass through the checkpoint. As the hand was going up, the face was becoming flush, I felt like God was going, no, 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 no. Don't let anger be the thing. 
And then all of a sudden, here, here's, how, here's what God does. Don't let anger get higher than the knowledge of God, the word of God. Then all of a sudden, Proverbs 29, 11 started to come to my mind and, and, and really just messed up the whole drive. This is what it was. You can recognize fools by the way that they give full vent to their rage and let words fly. But the wise bite their tongue and hold back all they could say. And at that point, I'm going, God, I want to be wise. Let me let, erect the knowledge of God wall. Let that fortress, that stronghold, that makes me think rage and anger in a vehicle is an acceptable place. Even if you live in New York City, it's acceptable to do that. That's a stronghold, folks, I'm telling you. And that's where the, you got to begin. The word of God is like a sledgehammer and starts to knock the bricks out and says, get the knowledge of God higher because that, that stronghold is trying to exalt itself. Second, second Corinthians 10, 10, 4 and 5, trying to exalt itself higher than the knowledge of God. And so when I begin to take Proverbs 29, 11 and put it up higher, it begins to take a sledgehammer to rage, a sledgehammer to anger. Folks, that's what God thinks of anger. It's, it's getting his higher. Folks, it's it, 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 to any of us, when I'm faced with a lust or, or my mind starts to go into a place, the enemy will try to fill my mind with, with thoughts that are ungodly. And I, he wants me to build a fortress to think that I can't get rid of those thoughts, that I can't fight those thoughts, to bring those up. And, and I'm telling you, I, when those thoughts come, I am brought back to the amazing gift and treasure Cindy is to my life. I'm so grateful that when those, when lust thoughts want to come in, when something, something you see or think begins to try to come in, the enemy tries to build a stronghold. Let me tell you something. It's trying to get higher than the knowledge of God. My mind immediately goes back up to Proverbs 18, 22 and says, here's the knowledge of God. When a man finds a wife, he finds a treasure or some versions say a good thing. Cindy is a good thing. She's a treasure to my life. He says, he, Solomon goes on and says, for she the, is a gift of God to bring him joy and pleasure. But the one who divorces a good woman lose what is good from his house. To choose an adulteress is both stupid and ungodly. And when those thoughts of lust try to come, I'm going Proverbs 18, 22. Knowledge of God, go up higher than that thought. You have given me a treasure. You have given me a good thing. That's what all of a sudden I started to realize this. Jot this down. When you fix your thoughts on God, God fixes your thoughts. When you fix your thoughts on God, then the knowledge of God goes higher than the fortress, than the imagination. And the imagination starts being cast down and the knowledge of God begins to go up. It's fear. Will I have a job when the dust clears? Will I be able to afford rent of this apartment? Will I be able to send my child to that school, to that private school or to the university? Now fear starts to raise up higher than the caring provision of God. You know, you have knowledge of God. He is a provider. You have knowledge of God. He is able to, to provide everything we need. And all of a sudden, fear starts to build a fortress. Fear starts to build um, an imagination. Fear starts to build something that's not part of the nature and character of God. And so when I watch fear go up in my own life, all of a sudden, how do, I, how do I raise the knowledge of God higher than the fear? Remember, it's the word of God and the spirit of God. 2 Timothy 1.7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Let, let, me, let me finish with this last one. Because I'll face this, and in fact, I faced it this week, and it's just, it's a vulnerable point. It's one of those 10,000 thoughts that are very vulnerable for me. Um, the enemy knows that a vulnerable spot for me to build a wall or an imagination is sickness, is this thought of death. The enemy, the enemy goes after that. And um, this week I was getting blood work for my, um, for my annual physical. And just even walking there, I felt those 10,000 thoughts trying to predict my future. This is not going to go good. This is going to be bad. They're going to find something. This is it. You'll never, and it usually starts like this. You'll never walk those three precious teenage girls ever down an aisle. You'll not be there to celebrate for them. And it's, this, it's just one of those 10,000 thoughts that try to predict my future. And, and it's, it's a stronghold. It's, a, it's an imagination that seems to try to go up. And it's at that point that, that like Chris sang for us, God, I want to see a victory on this. 
And all of a sudden, I had to raise up the knowledge of God higher than what the imagination, what the narrative, the false narrative was coming against me at that point. No, God, you called me here. God, I'm going to see a victory. And all of a sudden, I have to raise the, Remember, the knowledge of God comes from the word of God. And then all I thought about was Hebrews 2.15. This is what it says about Jesus. By embracing death, Jesus sets free those who live their entire lives in bondage to the tormenting dread of death. What he was saying was that Jesus overcame death. Jesus fought through all that because he wants us to make, he wants us to understand that he faced that for us, that we don't have to live by the fear of death. And all of a sudden, I remember the great words of the 18th century evangelist, George Whitfield, who said these words, I am immortal until God calls me home. Death, my, when I'm supposed to go to heaven, that's in God's hands. It's not in a disease hands. It's not in blood works hands. It's not in a doctor's hands. It's in God's hands. And then I started to realize, and I just started to whisper the words, God in us, God for us, God is with us. Think, just whisper those words right now, wherever you're at, because what you do, you start erecting that wall of the knowledge of God. God is in us through the Holy Spirit. God is for us, Romans chapter eight. If, if, it, who can be, if God is for us, who can be against us? And God is with us. That's his name, Emmanuel. Say those words again, God in us. God is for us. God is with us. God is in us, Holy Spirit, hallelujah. God is for us, Romans chapter eight, so who could be against us? And God is with us, he is Emmanuel. You're gonna see a victory today. Those strongholds that it seemed to always be bigger than the knowledge of God. Those imaginations that always seem to erect walls higher than the truth of God, the word of God. Today is a day for it to come down. Today is a day for those walls to come down. Here, here's, here's a thought that tries to get higher than the knowledge of God, the, of, what, of what, how God thinks, acts, his nature and character. How can God love me? Does he even know what I've done? I, I've, I've used his name in vain. I've cursed God. I've fought against God. I'm away from God. How can God ever ever love me. And all of a sudden, that imagination, that stronghold has gotten up higher than the knowledge of God. And you have forgotten that there is, the knowledge of God goes much higher than anything you could have ever done. Any thought you could have ever think, any word that would have cursed God or taken his name, anything that you would have said right now, I have to tell you, there's a higher, there's a higher word that comes to take a sledgehammer to that stronghold. How, Pastor Tim, how, how does that happen? Listen, listen, because here's where God wants you to understand. He says it in Romans chapter five, verse eight. But Christ proved God's passionate love for us by dying in our place while we were still lost and ungodly. Look at those words. He didn't die for us when we were in our best condition. He died for us in our worst condition. When we were far from God, God says, I love you. Wherever you're at right now, you could feel like, like I'm afraid of death. I'm afraid, of, I'm afraid that if I was to die today, all, all these things are going to come. But most of all, you're afraid that God doesn't care. God doesn't love you. God, God has forgotten you. And I'm here to tell you today, he loves you at your worst. Listen, at your worst, Romans 5, 8 says, God was at his best. God was at his best. While we were ungodly and lost, while we were far away from God, God was redeeming you back to him. He was establishing a way to heaven. And what you thought was, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough for God to love me. I'm not good enough to go to heaven. And I'm here to tell you today, that wall is going to come down right now. And you're going to have a victory in your life. Pastor Tim, what, what, do you, what do you mean by that? Because the pathway to forgiveness, the pathway to heaven, the pathway 
to knowing that you can have a relationship with God is not the wall you've erected of imaginations and strongholds. It's what Jesus said. Knowledge of God is found in the word of God. This is what Jesus said in John 3, 3 and John 3, 5. Unless a man or woman is born again, he can never enter into the kingdom of heaven. That's, that's the sledgehammer to this, I'm not good enough. That's the sledgehammer that comes to us that says, I'll, I'll, never, I'll, never, I'll never have a relationship with God. There, there are some of you that have actually are watching online because you've been so afraid to walk into a church. But I'm telling you, God loves you. He loves you. John 3, 16, in that same chapter, he says, you must be born again. He says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, that includes you today. Those that have ever doubted that if God could love me, today is that day. Then Pastor Tim, how, how do I get to heaven? Because I thought, that, I, I thought by being good, by getting baptized, I thought by, by providing for my family, for, for the good things outweighing the bad. Listen, those are all good things, but that's not the directions to God's house. You've erected an imagination and a wall that we've got to set the knowledge of God up higher than that. I think the best way to say it is this. If there's anybody that knows how to get to his own home, it's Jesus. He knows better than you. He knows better than me. And that's why he made it very clear in John 3, 3 and John 3, 5. Unless a man or woman is born again, he can never enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, Pastor Tim, how does that happen? How, how, how can I be born again? Can I... I want to make it as simple as I can because I want, I want every one of these letters because I always tell people it's as simple as ABC and I want, I want this to take a sledgehammer to the narrative, the imagination, the stronghold you put up that says you can't go to heaven, you can't be forgiven and you and God will never love you. I want to take a sledgehammer to that. I want to raise the knowledge of God higher, casting down imaginations. How does it happen, Pastor Tim? First, it's ABC, A, admitting that I'm a sinner. It's me getting honest with God that all of us have a condition called sin. It, it can't be fixed with a, a promise. can't be fixed with a program. can't be fixed with a pastor. We need help to fix this. We need help. I'm broken on the inside, and the diagnosis is called sin. I'm, I, I, I'm a sinner. It says, as one pastor said, I'm not mistakers in need of correction. We are needers. We are sinners in need of a savior. We, we don't need a second chance. We need a second birth. That's what John 3, 3 and John 3, 5 says. That's the A part. It's A, admitting that I'm a sinner. But it's also B, believing that God sent his son to fix my sinful condition because I can't fix myself. If we could fix this ourselves. And why would God have to ever send Jesus to come down and die in my place? If I could get myself to heaven by being good, then Jesus would never have to come and die on the cross. See, Jesus' death was him being my sin bearer, was him coming in my place. It's believing that I deserved, I deserved to die on that cross. It was, he died the death that I should have died. He lived a life that I could never live. And he gave us a reward, heaven and forgiveness that I even didn't deserve. And it's finally confess. That's the C word. A, admitting, B, believing, C, confessing him as Lord. That word confess is a big word. It's Romans 10, 9, and 10. Here's where the wall, here's where the smashing of the stronghold, the smashing of the imagination and the knowledge of God goes, down, uh, goes up. Because those thoughts have exalted themselves above the knowledge of God. It's confessing Jesus as Lord. God, God did not send Jesus 2,000 years ago on this planet for 33 years to work miracles, die on a cross, and resurrect from the dead to get us just to sit in a church for an hour or two hours every Sunday. That's not what it is. He didn't die to get you to church. He died to get you to heaven, to be with him forever. Today, today, the knowledge of God goes higher than the stronghold. It goes higher than the fortress, higher. Because those thoughts, it said, God can never love me. This is what I've done. This is the part of my life. But no, we're bringing it up higher. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. Finally, a way to fix those thoughts that seem to hold us in, 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 in captivity. But today, those things get broken. And most importantly, it's going to get broken today. 
because because this his goal I want you to get this Christianity this is important Christianity is not coming to a place Christianity is coming to a person and confessing him as Lord saying you are the one in charge of my life you're the boss that's what that word actually means and just as you had a first birth in a hospital today could be your second birth that's what you need that's what Jesus said you it's time just as you have a first birth date, a birthday, it's time for a second birth date. And that can happen right now. Right now. Wherever you're at, you're sitting on a couch, you're in your kitchen, you're, you're, you're in a car. Maybe, maybe it's not even Sunday. You mean God can change me and it's not Sunday? Absolutely. Some have erected this, this, this fortress and the strong one said, I, I've got to be in church to change. You could be right on that couch and change. You could be holding an Apple iPhone watching this or listening and be changed today. We've erected this strong line. I've got to be in a, in a religious building. I've got to be in a church to get, to get my life. I've got to stop this in order to change. Here's, here's what it is. It's not getting good and coming to Jesus, but you come to Jesus and he makes you good. That's the gospel. Well, Pastor Tim, I want to take that first step, but I'm not perfect. Join the club. Perfect people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. And today could be the first step. You can be born again. Today could be your second birth date. Today. Wherever you're at, even as a family, I want you to pray this. I want you to close your eyes wherever you're at. And I want you to pray this. If you're able to say it out loud, if you're able just to whisper it, wherever you're at, I want, if, if you go, Pastor Tim, I want today to be my second birthday. I want today to be my life change. I've, I've erected the Satan, those 10,000 thoughts, those, those religious thoughts, those thoughts have tried to come and predict what my future is. But today, imaginations have come down. Knowledge of God has gone up. Today, strongholds have come down. Knowledge of God has come up. Today is the day of salvation. Would you close your eyes Whisper these words. Say these words with me today. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe that on the cross you took my sin, my shame, and my guilt, and you died for it. You faced hell for me so I wouldn't have to go. You rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven purpose on earth and a relationship with your father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. Come on, say it with me. God is my father. Jesus is my savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper and heaven is my home. In Jesus name.